It's time for the last video in this series. So today we are gonna see who can beat Pokemon Crystal faster. Is it Feraligator or is it Blastoise? I think that it's worth quickly recapping the other two results that we've had so far. So when Venusaur went up against Meganium, the Kanto starter easily came out ahead. Despite having a less good starting moveset and less type coverage throughout the game, the Kanto starter really thrived just because of its base stat distribution as well as the fact that it has the additional poison typing which Meganium lacks. In the end, Venusaur finished the game 4 minutes and 26 seconds faster than Meganium. By the way, I play the game on 4 times speed, so if you're going to compare these times with like a speedrunner or something, just remember that fact. Then last week I did Charizard vs Typhlosion. In that case, the results were much closer. Typhlosion just barely ended up edging Charizard out, it was faster by 1 minute and 15 seconds, and both of the fire types got significantly better times than the grass types. These results were so close, just because Charizard and Typhlosion have the exact same base stats. The only differences between them were once again the typing, Typhlosion is a mono fire type whereas Charizard is a fire flying type, and the fact that they have different move pools. Most notably, Typhlosion learned Thunder Punch, giving it coverage against significant water threats, whereas Charizard learned moves like Wing Attack and Dragon Breath which in the end were just not nearly as useful. Plus, the flying type really added to the number of weaknesses that Charizard had, and yeah, that was a problem, especially against Lance's Aerodactyl. Now, I mention all this information because it is relevant to the water starters. Blastoise and Feraligator are more similar to Venusaur and Meganium when looking at their base stat totals. In this case, they share two stats, 100 defense and 78 speed. Their other four stats contain the same values but have just been shuffled around. So the HP and special attack are swapped, and then the attack and special defense are swapped. This ends up creating the same sort of scenario that we had with Venusaur and Meganium. Blastoise is significantly more defensive with an amazing 105 special defense, whereas its attacking stats are only 83 and 85 respectively. However, Feraligator gets an incredible 105 attack, but honestly a quite lackluster 79 special attack. This is its second worst stat, and as a water type, all water moves are special, so that's kind of disappointing. As a kid, I remember using Feraligator, and I was always a little bit disappointed with how little damage moves like Surf did when I was using it. Now, when comparing with the two previous videos, one major difference is the fact that Feraligator and Blastoise have the exact same typing. They are both mono water types. And these similarities continue into their move pools. If we look at the TM and HM sets first, they are almost identical. There are some notable exceptions, so let's go through them. Blastoise can learn Defense Curl. After all, it is a turtle. Whereas Feraligator gets Detect and Fury Cutter. Blastoise does get Waterfall, but this move isn't very useful in Generation 2. After all, Surf is just basically a better version of this move and you get it earlier into the playthrough. So in terms of moves that these two can learn, the only differentiating factors are the ones that they learn at the start of the game as well as through level up. Feraligator gets the better attacking move in the form of Scratch. They both get a move that can lower defense, so Tail Whip and Leer. And then Feraligator's set is just rounded out by two much better moves, Rage and Water Gun. And that's comparing these two moves to uh, Bubble and Withdraw. By the way, in Generation 2, Rage is really good at the beginning of the game. If you want to see proof of that, go and watch my Dunsparce videos because, yeah, Rage just allows that thing to sweep through the early games so easily. Now, luckily for Blastoise, it isn't all bad because it does get Water Gun at level 13. These are both medium-slow growth rate Pokemon, so that level is going to come pretty quick. And then through level up, they both don't have very many more notable moves. Maybe Rain Dance will see some play, but I'm not entirely sure about that. After all, I'm figuring that moves like Surf, Ice Punch, Earthquake, and Return are going to be their primary go-tos. Alright, so now let's get into this playthrough. For this one, I did defeat Sprout Tower. Again, I filmed these first playthroughs in close proximity with the first playthroughs for all of the other starters. Which is actually quite a while ago now because these playthroughs were filmed in April. Now if you're thinking that Sprout Tower would be hard for these two water types, it really isn't. That is largely because Feraligator has an absolutely beastly attack stat and Scratch is quite a good move for the early game. After finishing off the two trainers in Faulkner's gym, I am ready to take on the first gym leader.
Now if this was a conventional speed run, I would be using Rage to knock out his Pokemon, because every time I get hit, its power builds. However in this case, because I'm starting with the final form, I can just use Water Gun to one-shot his first Pidgey. Now it's time for Pidgeotto, this thing is not that scary, Water Gun does more than half. It hits Gust, doing only 3 damage to Feraligator, because remember this thing has good physical defenses. After that I knock his Ace out with Water Gun, and with that, I have earned myself the first badge. So now let's switch over to Blastoise playthrough and see how it's going to do with the very earliest portions of the game. Unfortunately, if you're a fan of this turtle, I don't have good news for you. And that's because all of the early game threats I'm going to have to knock out quite slowly, because Tackle has 5 lower base power than Scratch, as well as the fact that it has a 5% chance to miss, and Bubble is a base 20 power move. So with the same type attack bonus, it only has a 30 effective power. That is half the power of Feraligator's Water Gun. As a result, I expect Blastoise to be off to a slow start here. However, there is the uh, whole fable of the tortoise and the hare, so maybe it's more like the uh, tortoise and the alligator in this case. Perhaps Blastoise has something hidden in its shell that it's going to be able to unleash later on in the playthrough to be able to catch up. However, I think it's time for a prediction, and I really do think that Feraligator is going to win this one. After all, it is the speedrunner's choice for Generation 2, but I don't expect Blastoise to be that far behind. After all, it isn't losing significant time in Sprout Tower. This is because its outrageous special defense means it doesn't take very much damage from Vine Whip, so I am able to get through here without having any resets or having to backtrack to the Pokemon Center. So now, let's head into Faulkner's Gym and take on the first Gym Leader. At this point, the turtle has also learned Water Gun, so I can one-shot the Pidgey, move on to the Pidgeotto, and knock it out over two turns, earning myself the first badge. Now, with this comes a 12.5% boost to my attack stat, which is nice for moves like Tackle, and I also get access to the TM for Mud Slap, which I'm going to teach to both Blastoise and Feraligator right away. After exiting the gym, I have to head over to the Pokemon Center to pick up the egg. A lot of people have asked if this is optional, and it actually isn't. If you try to proceed south of Violet City, on the next route, there is a little guy who gives you the Miracle Seed, and he will stop you from proceeding until you talk to Professor Oak's aid and get the egg. Now because I know which HM users I'm going to need throughout the playthrough, I will need 5 in total. That does mean that eventually I will have to deposit the egg, so I want to do that right away so that it doesn't hatch and waste extra time. Okay, so with that out of the way, now I can proceed south of Violet City, and on my way, I'm going to pick up the Paralyzed Cure Berry. Now because this is a first playthrough, and both Bugsy and Whitney have moves that get more powerful over time, I'm going to fight some optional trainers here just to level up a little bit more. Next is Union Cave, and the typical thing to do here is grab Swift, but both Feraligator and Blastoise cannot learn this move, so I'm just going to head straight to Azalea Town. Outside of the cave, of course, Hiker Anthony catches me, but unlike Charizard, I have nothing to fear here. I can one-shot the Geodude with Water Gun, and then take out the Machop over two turns. In Azalea Town's Mart is the first place that you can purchase Repels, so I always stop by here and spend money on Eleven. This will get me all the way through the playthrough to Olivine City, where I can purchase more super repels later on. Also, I spend some of my money on escape ropes. This is just so I can navigate the map more easily throughout the rest of the playthrough. It saves a little bit of time here and there. Okay, so it's time for Slowpoke Well. This place is completely trivial for Blastoise. And with all the rockets out of the way, I continue leveling up in Bugsy's gym against the mandatory trainers. This pushes Blastoise up to level 19, where it can learn the move Bite. Now, a few things about this move for Generation 2. If you're a Generation 1 fan, you'll know that Bite is a normal type move. And if you play the games after Generation 4, you'll know that Bite is a physical move. Here, it is a dark type move, and it deals special damage because all dark moves are special. Also, it does have a 30% chance to flinch, so it's a great go-to move if things are getting a little bit sketchy. And I'm thinking that it might be useful as a backup to break Scyther's Fury Cutter combo in the case that things are going poorly. Anyways, let's see how the battle's actually going to go. So first of all, I want to point out a mistake I am making. Here, I do not have a 
Poison Cure Berry, which I really should have because I'm not able to one-shot the first Metapod, and that means the Kakuna is likely going to survive and have a chance to use Poison Sting. However, in this case, Blastoise gets a critical hit with Water Gun, so Kakuna goes down in a single turn. Okay, so now it's time for Scyther. Let's see how much damage Water Gun is doing. Looks like a quarter. It goes for Fury Cutter. Blastoise's fantastic defense shrugs it off. I take Scyther to half health. Fury Cutter starts to deal more damage, but it really isn't doing enough, so I'm gonna survive the third hit, and actually quite comfortably with green health. As a result, I'm able to hit my fourth Water Gun, and Scyther goes down. For Blastoise, earning the Hive Badge really doesn't matter. It gives a boost to the power of Bug-type moves, and Blastoise can't learn Fury Cutter. So let's just proceed with the playthrough and fight the rival. Up first is Ghastly. Bite is super effective here, knocking it out in a single hit. Next, he sends in Bayleaf. Now this thing is absolutely terrifying because it knows Razor Leaf, which is a 55 base power move with an increased critical hit chance. Now, lacking access to Swift, which would be better against Bayleaf, I am going to have to use Bite, which is unfortunate because of Faulkner's boost, my special attack is worse than my physical attack currently. Now, Bayleaf set up Reflect on the first turn, which is absolutely useless when I am spamming a special move, and then when it starts to use Razor Leaf, it really isn't doing that much damage. This is the fantastic special defense for you. So I'm able to finish the rival's ace off with green health remaining. All he has left is Zubat, which I quickly clean up with two uses of Water Gun, and now Blastoise is heading towards Goldenrod City. On the way, I can pick up the TM for Headbutt, which is a fantastic replacement for Tackle. In Goldenrod City, I explore the underground to grab the coin case. This allows me to purchase an Abra. This thing is fantastic because you can use Teleport to save a lot of time in the overworld. Some people have mentioned that then it's not truly a Blastoise-only playthrough because I'm using another Pokemon to save some time, but every other Pokemon that I do a run with also has access to this Abra, so I figure the time savings are evenly distributed against all other Pokemon. On, so really this is just making things more convenient for me. After heading north to talk to Floria, I explore the national park where I can pick up Dig, which I am going to teach to Blastoise right away in the place of Mudslap. After all, this move is fantastic for breaking Miltank's combo with Rollout in the case that it gets scary, but I don't really think that that's going to happen just because of how good Blastoise's defense is. However, even with this new move, there is one more moveset upgrade that I want to make before I take on Whitney. And no, it is not teaching Blastoise Rapid Spin. That move is absolutely trash in a solo playthrough. I don't know about competitive. Maybe it's useful in Generation 2 competitive to clear entry hazards. I don't actually know. Anyways, the move that I do want to to teach Blastoise is Ice Punch. And in this case, I think that it makes sense to give up Water Gun. After all, once I clear Whitney, I'm going to get access to Surf, which is going to be my go-to water move. So now, with this powerful Ice-type move on my set, I'm ready for my third gym battle. First is Clefairy. Now this thing could be really annoying if it uses Metronome and gets something like Parish Song. I do think objectively I make a mistake here by going for Ice Punch on the first turn. It has a 10% chance to freeze, but I should have gone for Headbutt for the 30% chance to flinch. This could have prevented Clefairy from getting a move in. Either way, I don't think it matters because Clefairy just goes for Double Slap and I finish it on the second turn. Okay, so now it is time for Whitney's Miltank. Here we have an opportunity to demonstrate just how bad this thing is in terms of special defense when compared with its physical defense. I go for Bite on the first turn and it does a decent amount of damage, also causing a flinch. Then, because my attack stat is higher, I was like, no, I should be using Headbutt, and it does basically the same amount of damage. That is, with the fact that Headbutt has 10 more base power than Bite, so yeah, when you can hit Miltank with a special move, it is better to do so. Honestly, I think the best thing to do here would be just to spam Ice Punch. I probably would have knocked it out in three turns if I did that. Either way, I take it down over four turns and easily earn myself the plane badge. So let's see how Feraligator does in this portion of the game. Essentially the only difference going into the Bugsy fight is going to be the fact that I don't have access to Bite because Feraligator learns this move at level 21. However, with how easy these early gyms have been so far, I don't think that that's a problem. With Feraligator's lower special attack stat, it is doing less damage with Water Gun against all of Bugsy's Pokemon. Once again, I probably should have had a Poison Cure Berry here just to be safe, but luckily I do make it to the Scyther with no status condition. Water Gun is doing about a quarter, Fury Cutter is doing very little to me, and because Feraligator has the same defense stat, it is also able to defeat Bugsy, maintaining green health for the entire battle. 
And now onto the rival. Here the lack of bite is actually impactful because I'm going to have to use Water Gun against the Ghastly. However, it's more than enough to knock his lead out in one hit. Next he sends in Bayleaf, I misclick and use Water Gun against it. Luckily it just misses Poison Powder, so I basically got a little bit of free damage. Because Bayleaf is a grass type, my best choice here is Scratch. Maybe I could be using Rage, but in this case, that wasn't the choice I made. It looks like I'm going to need at least four Scratches to knock the Bayleaf out. It hits a Razor Leaf, for Alligator eats its Berry, healing back up to high orange health. And then, with Bayleaf's next Razor Leaf, it gets a critical hit. And yeah, that did so much damage, but Feraligator survives on two hit points. Okay, so while Feraligator survived, I am now going to have to knock it out with Scratch, and it doesn't look like I'm going to have the damage that I need. However, Scratch does enough and Bayleaf goes down. For Alligator levels up to level 21, gaining 3 hit points of health up to 5, and now can also learn the move Bite, which I'm going to teach in the place of Rage. Last is Zubat. Here, my fingers are crossed. I really hope that Water Gun is going to be able to get the one hit, and in this case, it doesn't. Zubat goes for Bite. It does quite little damage, and For Alligator survives on 2 hit points once again, finishing the fight off. So I'm definitely going to need to figure out how to play that fight better for my follow up playthrough. So the next portion of the game is essentially identical between these two Pokemon. Now, I did unlearn Rage, and Feraligator could learn Fury Cutter for Whitney. After all, this move is usually great at countering her Pokemon, but I don't think that that's necessary. After all, adding Dig and Ice Punch to its moveset should be more than enough. Whitney sends in Clefairy first, I go for Headbutt against it, taking it to red health, and it retaliates with Double Slap, doing very little. My next Headbutt takes it out, and here I will mention the fact that I was playing Feraligator first, so I was just playing badly with Blastoise, it's not that I had more information for this playthrough. Next, she sends in Miltank, I do go for Ice Punch here, it does less than a third, rollout hits, getting a critical hit, doing a decent amount for the first turn. My next Ice Punch takes Miltank to orange health, rollout continues to increase in damage, but I still have green health left over. Now here I make an objectively bad choice, I choose to use Bite in case it causes a flinch. I should have gone for Headbutt, because I am sure that if I did, Feraligator would have got the knockout. Instead, I don't get it, Miltank survives on a small amount of health, gets one more rollout in, but even that isn't enough. I break the combo with Dig, and finish Whitney off. So with her badge, my Pokemon get a 12.5% boost to their speed stat. Additionally, they also get a 12.5% boost to all normal type moves. However, both of those aren't immediately useful because I have to defeat Pseudo Udo. I require myself to knock it out in all my first playthroughs, I just think things are more fun this way. Now because I deleted my water moves before Whitney, I am going to have to use Dig against this thing. Luckily, Feraligator just gets a critical hit, knocking it out in one turn. That's perfect. And with the way cleared, I can now head into Ecritique City and face the Kimono Girls. This is one of the most experienced rich locations in the entire game. After I defeat all of them, Feraligator is level 27. But the real prize for doing this is access to HM03, which is Surf. In this case, I had to decide which move to unlearn. Dig is very useful for coverage against electric types. Headbutt is a fantastic normal type move, which actually has the highest effective power of my entire set. After that, Ice Punch is fantastic against grass types, so I think it's time to say goodbye to Bite. While this move does seem immediately useful against Morty's team, the fact that it's a special move means that Dig is just going to perform better anyways, because the ghosts don't have particularly sturdy defenses. However, I'm not even going to take on Morty right away, because instead I'm going to go to the Lighthouse and do all of the additional training between Ecritique City and this location. After the final battle here, Feraligator is almost level 30, and now it is time to use an escape rope and teleport to head back to Ecritique City to face the rival in Burned Tower. In the case that I'm relying on Dig, I really need to ensure that it's going to one-hit the first Haunter, and in this case, with Feraligator's amazing attack, it obviously does. I can finish off the following Magnemite in one hit, then I can Ice Punch the Bayleaf, which is going to get a two hit, it just goes for Reflect, so this entire fight was essentially free. 
After that, I will point out a small detail that I do to save a tiny bit of time. After I release the legendary beasts, I always call them legendary dogs by the way, and then people are like, no, they're actually beasts. I'm, I'm so sorry. Anyways, after that, I can use an escape rope so that I don't have to talk to you, Sin, here, preventing a small amount of dialogue. So now, it is time to head into Morty's gym, defeat the mandatory trainers here, leveling for Alligator up to level 32, and with them out of the way, it is now time for my fourth gym battle. In this case, to save time, I'm going to use Surf against the first two ghosts. I am pretty sure that it is going to do more than enough damage to take them out. Okay, the Ghastly goes down, so it can't use Curse. Next is Haunter. Maybe if I was playing a little bit safer, I would have used Dig against it, but Surf gets the job done. Now against the Gengar, I want to be safe, and I'm going to use Dig. While it has lower effective power, even with super effective damage, the Gengar has much less defense, so this is the better move. And in this case, I finish it off in a single hit, so I didn't even need a Mint Berry for this battle. All that's left is Morty's final Haunter, I go for Surf, and I take it out with one hit. Okay, so that was a very easy fourth badge for Feraligator. Switching back to Blastoise's playthrough, I actually made a slightly different choice. I know that with the badge boost, my attack stat is higher than my special attack, but I figured that giving up Headbutt might be better. I'm not really sure about this. In the end, it actually doesn't matter that much, so don't worry about it. After that, I head into Burned Tower. This is after taking care of the Lighthouse. Exact same order of events that Feraligator did. So let's see how Blastoise does against the rival. Even with its lower attack stat, Dig does more than enough to one-shot the Haunter, and because of this, I'm just gonna sweep his team. To save some time, I knock the Magnemite out with one hit from Surf, and then because Blastoise has higher special, it is able to get the one hit on the Bayleaf. So what that definitely means is that I'm going to one-hit the first two of Morty's Pokémon with a special move. In this case, I got seduced by super effective damage and chose Bite. It does knock the Ghastly out, but I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Surf's effective power is actually higher. Luckily for me, even making this misplay against the Haunter still allows Blastoise to get a one-hit, so that's perfect. Now, against the Gengar, I'm once again going to use Dig, and in this case, Blastoise's lower attack stat does not allow it to get the one-hit. However, uh, it doesn't matter, because Gengar just uses Hypnosis, misses, I would have healed with the Mint Berry anyways, so I finish Morty's ace off. Like, I think the Gengar is his ace, I know that it's the third Pokémon on his team, but this final Haunter is definitely not the ace Pokémon. It should have been a Mistrevis. like, let's just be real about that, it, it should have been. So with that fight out of the way, it is time to check in with the splits. In the early portions of the game, for Faulkner, Bugsy, and Whitney, there was about a 1 minute and 30 second difference between Feraligator and Blastoise, with Feraligator in the lead. Obviously this time was all generated in the early game when Feraligator had a significantly better move set. Water Gun and Scratch are just much better than Bubble and Tackle. However, once we reached Morty, and Blastoise had access to Surf, Ice Punch, and Bite, it really started to gain a small advantage where it was just one hitting a few more Pokemon just because its special attack stat is higher. So now Feraligator only has a 46 second lead. Now here I should mention two things. The first is that in all my first playthroughs, Hidden Power is banned. That is specifically because this move isn't very interesting in an initial playthrough. After all, in this case, I can just make it any type that I want and solve a lot of problems that way. So that does slightly disincentivize me to head to Mahogany Town next, because I could potentially take on the Rocket plotline and then defeat Price as my next badge. That could be an advantageous way to play if you wanted more special attack because the Glacier Badge boosts this stat. However, that does lead me to my second point, which is usually I think it is better to face Chuck as the fifth gym leader, just because earning access to Fly is really pivotal for saving a lot of walking time. So of course, that is what I'm going to be doing with Blastoise. Now here I will mention the fact that I have to use Surf against these two Black Belts teams. This is a bit annoying because the Hitmons actually have fantastic special defense in Generation 2. I'm always not used to this, I'm so used to playing Generation 1 where these things have trash special, but that's not the case here, so I have to two-hit both of them. With them out of the way, it is now time to face Chuck.
I still have my mint berry from the Morty battle, so I should be fine here. Surf doesn't one hit the primate and it lowers my defense with leer. Okay, so dynamic punch is gonna hit much harder as a result. I finish his lead off, moving on to the polywrath. On the first turn in battle, I use dig so that I go underground, preventing its hypnosis from landing. However, Dig only does a quarter. Then, Polyrath goes for Mind Reader, which I figured that I could just get around by going underground with Dig. Turns out, when Mind Reader is on the field, Polyrath can still use Dynamic Punch and hit me when Blastoise is underground. Who else didn't know that? Anyways, it's nice to learn a new thing about the games. Luckily, Blastoise doesn't hit itself in confusion, and I take the Polyrath down to half health. It misses a dynamic punch, which is very fitting, and then I had to make a choice. I don't think using Dig while confused is the best play, plus, Surf actually has the highest effective power of all my moves, so let's use it. In this case, it takes the Polyrath down to red health, then finally, Blastoise gets put to sleep, but luckily, I have a Mint Berry just for that. Confusion doesn't prevent my next Surf, and with that, Chuck is no more. And now, with Fly, it is time to majorly upgrade the items that I have access to. I can fly back to New Bark Town and pick up the Pink Bow on the first route of the game. After that, in Cherry Grove City, I pick up the Mystic Water, which is going to make Surf just so broken. After that, I grab three rare candies, one in Violet City, one south of Goldenrod City, and one at the Lake of Rage. And here I need to defeat the Red Gyarados. Well, that's not exactly true. I did say in my previous video that you have to either catch or defeat it, but you can also use a Poké Doll to run away. However, I am not going to be doing that. I would rather save my money for vitamins, as well as move tutor moves, later on in the game. Once I defeat Lance, I will get access to Ice Beam, which is a fantastic upgrade for Ice Punch. With the Gyarados and all of the rockets out of the way, it is time to head into the Mahogany Town Gym and face Price. Okay, so it's time to take on my least favorite Pokemon, Seal. I knock it out with two uses of Surf, move on to Price's Dugong. By the way, my type matchups here are not very good. Yes, Surf is my best damage against these water types, which is a little bit annoying. I finish his second Pokemon off with three hits, and now finally I have a good type matchup because Surf is super effective against the Piloswine. So with the Glacier Badge, I get two amazing buffs. I get a buff to my special attack stat, as well as to Ice-type moves, which makes Ice Punch much better. And now we are going to continue with the Rapid Fire Gym Leaders, because after talking to Jasmine and healing Amphi, I use an Escape Rope and head over to the gym in Olivine City to face her. Now the Steel type is the best defensive type in the game, and it takes neutral damage from only two types in Generation 2. By the way, in these games it does resist Ghost and Dark moves. So the types that deal neutral damage to it are Electric and Water, which is very convenient for Blastoise. As a result, I can use Surf to knock out both of the Magnemites in a single hit each, completely bypassing the risk of getting hit by Thunder Wave or Thunderbolt. All that's left is Steelix, but it is weak to water moves, so I knock it out in a single hit and easily earn myself the 7th badge. Now if we switch back to Feraligatr's footage, we can see just how similarly these Pokemon are playing. They have nearly identical movesets throughout the mid-game, and honestly the only real differentiating factor is the fact that Feraligatr hits harder with physical moves, whereas Blastoise hits harder with special moves. In the fight against Chuck, Feraligatr is able to knock the Polyrath out slightly faster by using Headbutt, which is doing a lot of damage per turn. Here the Mint Berry saves me from Hypnosis, and I take an easy victory. After collecting items and finishing the Rocket plotline off, Feraligatr faces Price, and yeah, Headbutt one-hits the Seal, so that's slightly faster, and then Headbutt is able to two-hit the Dugong, also faster. Because the Piloswine is kind of a trash Pokemon, like, ugh, oh, this thing is so bad. I loved it as a kid, by the way, but it really underperforms. Because of that, I'm able to just one-shot it with Surf, so Feraligatr gets a faster victory here, too. Finally, Jasmine is an easy sweep with three uses of Surf. Okay, so that leads me to the most boring part of the game, the rocket plotline in Radio Tower. Here, I'm going to make one moveset upgrade to each Pokemon. For Feraligatr, I'm going to teach it Return, because this is a physical move. This is going to allow me to sweep through all of the major battles here very easily. The only Pokemon that has any potential to be threatening to Feraligatr is the rival's Meganium, and uh, yeah, Ice Punch does more than half. Then this thing hits a critical hit with Razor Leaf, which does less than half to me, and I finish it off on the next turn. 
So for, for Alligator, there really isn't anything to worry about in this portion of the game, and with the rockets defeated, I can head through Ice Path. This area I find interestingly positioned. It's basically the game saying, hey, you should add an ice type to your team, and then immediately following it, Claire is the gym leader. However, uh, I don't add Pokemon to my team because you just play through the game with one Pokemon, right? That's uh, that's how you're supposed to beat these games. Um, uh, yeah, right? Like, uh, what's team building? Honestly, as a kid, I didn't know. And as an adult, I'm uh, definitely training myself not to know. However, for me, there's a solution here because I can just pick up the Nevermelt Ice and improve for Alligator's Ice Punch. Also, just to be safe, I am going to pick up the TM for Rest. This might be useful in the very late stages of the game or if I get stuck during the league. With all of that out of the way, now let's take on the last gym leader. Okay, so for Alligator, it is going to get three one-hits on all of the Dragonairs. That is guaranteed. After that, she sends in Kingdra. Now here I have Return, which is a fantastic physical move, with an effective 112 power right now, so I'm easily able to two-hit her ace, and with that, for Alligator is off towards the league. I want you to just quickly look up at the time as I'm in Victory Road. We are at 54 minutes. If you are not like me and don't play Pokemon Crystal over and over and over again with a bunch of different Pokemon, you probably won't have context for this time. It's absolutely fantastic. At the current pace, Feraligatr might be able to finish the league just over one hour of playtime, which puts it on pace for perhaps one of the fastest playthroughs I've done to date. And making things even better for it is the fact that TM26 is in Victory Road. This is Earthquake, and it's a fantastic upgrade for Dig. Okay, I don't really know what to say against the rival before the league. I could narrate this fight, but I don't want to. Instead, I'm just going to keep singing for Alligator's praise. This thing has no problems. And if I look out to the rest of the league, like, what is going to stop it? Water-type Pokemon only have two weaknesses, Electric and Grass. There is only one Grass-type Pokemon in the entire league. It is Karen's Vileplume, and it's not a very good Pokemon. Also, I have Ice Punch to take care of it. And if we look for Electric-type Pokemon, there are a grand total of zero of them in the league. One of Lance's Dragonites does have Thunder. However, I'm just going to one-hit it with Ice Punch. What is going to stand in for Alligator's way? Honestly, I don't think anything. However, before we see how Feraligator does in the league, let's catch up with Blastoise. As we should be expecting by now, this water type is also quite fantastic. I do need to sing Blastoise's praise. Honestly, I don't really like this turtle that much. A lot of people really hate on the Generation 5 starters like Embor, like it's this big, like kind of boxy, firefighting type, and no one likes it. I actually kind of like Embor, but I really don't like Blastoise. Of the first six starters, it is my least favorite, but that is exclusively because of its design. In terms of its battle prowess, it's honestly quite good. And during the rocket plot line, I am going to give it a new move. So going into the rival fight here, you can see that I've taught it Rain Dance in the place of Bite. But it doesn't really turn out to be useful because Blastoise can just sweep everything it needs to with Surf anyways. By the time I'm through Ice Path, I've realized this, so I teach it Return in Rain Dance's place. And now, let's fight Claire. It goes exactly the same as it did with Feraligator. Three one hits on the Dragonair, and then a two hit on the Kingdra with Return. Mirroring for Alligator, Blastoise can also learn Earthquake, so I teach it in the place of Dig, and these two have the exact same moveset against the rival before the league. I think this might be the first Versus video where the Pokemon have played this similarly. Like honestly, I think holding on to Bite around Morty with Blastoise was probably just a mistake. I could have just used Surf to greater effect anyways. So what I'm thinking is that for my follow-up playthrough, these two are just going to have the exact same moveset. However, maybe... Just maybe they'll struggle in some way against the league? Let's find out. Okay, so Will is first. Ice Punch, one hits the Zatu. Ice Punch, one hits the Executor. Return, one hits the Jinx. And then Will sends out his Slowbro, which apparently is the most terrifying Pokemon on his team because it takes a grand total of three hits, and it actually does damage. Not a lot of damage at that, so I move on to his final Zatu, hit it with Ice Punch, and knock it out in a single hit. Well done, Blastoise. Okay, so maybe Koga will be a little bit harder. Here's the thing though, uh, one hit on the Iriados. 
one hit on the following Venomoth. Then Surf actually one hits the Fortress, which I was not expecting. I can use Earthquake to one hit the Muck, and now all that's left is Crobat. And here, Koga does prove that he is the second Elite Four member, because Crobat outspeeds, by one speed I will have you know. It uses Double Team, causing Ice Punch to miss, and uh, yeah, I guess that wastes some time, but I still do manage to knock it out and take a first attempt victory. Ooh, he even snuck in a little status condition right at the end. Cheeky. All right, so it's time for Bruno, and uh, I expected Surf to one-hit the Hitmon top, but like I said before, this thing actually has decent special defense. By the way, I never noticed before that all of the Hitmons actually have the exact same special defense on Bruno's team. Thing is, it goes underground, so I can just knock it out without it dealing any damage because I have Earthquake. Next is Hitmonchan. I do use Return to go up against its physical defense, but it still survives and does a small amount of damage. Next is Hitmonlee. Return one hits. Then, it's time for the Machamp. I use Surf, doing more than half. It hits with Cross Chop, and that doesn't even take Blastoise into orange health. As a result, my next Surf finishes it off, and of course, uh, his most intimidating Pokemon, Onyx, is next. So I finish it with a Surf, and with that, I'm moving on to Karen. Now in most playthroughs, she's the most difficult member of the Elite Four. A lot of this comes down to the fact that I can never one-hit the Umbreon unless I am outrageously overleveled. That means it usually gets a sand attack in, but in this case it just misses. So yeah, I'm gonna knock it out. Oh, never mind. It just barely survives and then uses Confuse Ray on Blastoise. Blastoise hits itself, I take damage from Faint Attack, which is only a small amount of damage. Blastoise hits itself again, take more chip damage from Faint Attack, and then it finally finishes off her lead with Surf. Next, she sends in Vileplume. I go for Ice Punch for maximum damage, but it just barely doesn't get the KO. However, I've already prepared for this thing because it loves using Stun Spore on the first turn it's in battle. My Berry prevents the status, and I move on to Gengar. Against it, I can one-shot with Earthquake, preventing it from using Curse or Destiny Bond, and from here, things should get easier. I can one-hit the Murkrow with Ice Punch, and all that's left is Houndoom. Obviously, it takes super effective damage from Surf, so Blastoise finishes it off, and with that, it has made it with no resets all the way to Lance. Alright, so this league has been so short, let's just continue and see how Blastoise does against Lance. First up is Gyarados, and I thought that it was going to go for Rain Dance, but it just uses Surf against me. Like, is it trying not to set up the rain so that I don't have it? But that doesn't really make sense, he has a lot of dragons after this. Also, the Gyarados does have Hyper Beam, it should have used that. Okay, so it's time for Lance's first Dragonite. This is the one that knows Thunder. So it is critical that Ice Punch does enough damage to knock it out. And it does. So let's watch the sweep. I want hit the second Dragonite. Next, he sends out his Ace Dragonite. This Dragonite is three levels higher, but that does not save it from my Ice Punch. Okay, so it's two Pokemon that should be very easy. I surf the Charizard, knocking it out in a single hit, and I surf the Aerodactyl to take a quick and easy victory over Lance. So Blastoise finishes the league almost under one hour. It clocks in with a time of one hour and four seconds. Honestly, that is an incredible time, especially for a first playthrough. So now, quickly, let's just check in with Feraligatr's most recent split, which was against Claire. If we compare the two Pokemon splits, it turns out that Feraligatr is only nine seconds ahead now. So it has the potential to squeeze in with a time under an hour during the league. Let's see if that's possible. First up, we have Will. Now, instead of narrating this fight, I want to talk about the potential for a loss here. Feraligatr is going to get one hits on all of his Pokemon except the Slowbro, and because moves that have 100% accuracy cannot miss randomly like they can in Generation 1, I am never going to have to take a move from any of those four Pokemon. That means the only Pokemon that can actually attack Feraligatr is the Slowbro. Of its moves, I think the one that would be worse to get hit by would be Body Slam. That way I could miss moves and then be knocked out over a few more turns. However, here's the thing about the Slowbro. It loves Amnesia and Curse. And this allows me to easily get two hits in and knock it out with Return. So yes, Feraligatr was able to finish Will with less turns than Blastoise. However, this small advantage is going to be neutralized by Koga, because I actually don't one-hit the Venomoth. This is just the disadvantage that Feraligatr has because its special attack is just slightly lower. Surprisingly though, I do one-hit the Fortress. Obviously, Earthquake one-hits the Muck, 
And now I've made it to his ace, Crobat. Because Blastoise didn't want hit with Ice Punch, I know that Feraligatr won't. And in this case, Koga doesn't waste my time with Double Team, instead he wastes my time by using full restores to heal the Crobat, and then eventually I do knock it out. Still though, no major setbacks for Feraligatr so far. And then against Bruno, he sends out his Hitmonchan. I was hoping that I would get the one hit just because I have nicer physical attack, but I don't. Hitmonchan just barely survives, hits Thunder Punch, and paralyzes for Alligator. Alright, so uh, that's bad. While I'm not taking that much damage, I could potentially miss a lot of key hits. And I am also slow now, so Pokemon like Hitmonlee can get in some chip damage before I knock them out. Okay, so it's time to go up against Bruno's ace, the Machamp. I was worried about Cross Chop hitting too many times in a row, but it actually just misses on the first turn. I hit Surf, Bruno uses a Max Potion, I take it back down to Orange Health, and then Cross Chop hits, but it doesn't do very much, and I finish his ace off. All that's left is Onyx, and while it does have Earthquake, which is objectively a good move, this thing has 54 attack, so it does almost nothing, and Feraligator takes a victory. So maybe Karen is going to cause the first reset for Feraligator. In this case, things start off worse than with Blastoise, because the Umbreon does get a sand attack in. However, my second return still hits, and I take her lead down. Unfortunately, against the Vileplume, I do miss and take one Petal Dance, which is annoying, because it actually does about a quarter. And then when Ice Punch hits, it doesn't even knock it out. So I take more damage from Petal Dance before I finish it off. Okay, time for Gengar. Earthquake, please do not miss. Oh, I clicked on return by accident. Uh, Gengar goes for Lick. In this case, it wouldn't have even mattered if it paralyzed me. When I finally choose Earthquake, it misses. Gengar does more chip damage with Lick. And then finally, on the fourth turn, I hit Earthquake and knock it out. Okay, so it should be easier from here, barring bad accuracy luck. Ice Punch hits Murkrow, knocking it out in a single turn. And now all that's left is her Houndoom. Despite Feraligatr's lower special attack, I do think that Surf is going to be slightly better here, just because of its much higher effective power. It hits, and Houndoom goes down. Okay, so no resets so far with Feraligatr. And as we saw against Lance with Blastoise, this fight is not going to be a problem. Interestingly enough, once again, the Gyarados does not use Rain Dance. It goes for Hyper Beam this time. Honestly, I think it's my theory now that the reason it went for Surf last time is because Surf does more damage than Flail. And when it did its test rolls, it saw that Hyper Beam missed and did no damage. And then it was like, yeah, I should definitely use Surf. And now from here, all of the Pokemon should be one hits, unless the special attack on Feraligatr is not quite enough to one hit the last Dragonite. But in this case, I take it out. From there, I have Surf for both the Aerodactyl and the Charizard. So Feraligatr finishes the league with an incredible sub hour time, 59 minutes and 44 seconds. Now, while this time is really amazing, it still is only 20 seconds ahead of Blastoise. And as I'm sure you'll know, these races usually come down to the last two battles in Kanto. The first one of these is against Blue. The reason he's usually so difficult is because his team has good type diversity. With most Pokemon, it is the case that you will at least struggle against one of his team members. And I knew that this was the case, so if you look at my Feraligatr's level, it jumped from 55 at the end of the league up to 71. I didn't do any additional training for this, I just used all my rare candies right before Blue. I figured that with how things are going and how close to the end of the game I am, I don't really need to save them for red. Maybe I would be one level higher if that was the case. Now because it's really overleveled, Feraligatr has secured one hits on his first three Pokemon, leading to his Gyarados. Against this thing, Return does way more than half, Gyarados strikes back with the, uh, underwhelming Twister. Probably another instance where the test roll with Hyper Beam missed. Anyways, Blue gets a little bit annoying here using a Floor Restore, so I have to take two more returns to knock it out. And from here, things are way easier. I one hit the Ride on with Surf, and all that's left is Arcanine. It is able to get an extreme speed in, but then I polish it off. So now, Feraligatr is ready for the ultimate challenge. But what about Blastoise? Here's the thing, I was playing it second because I figured that Feraligatr had an advantage in this race. 
As a result, I was able to shave off a little bit of additional training with Blastoise, which I think is nice to do when you can. As a result, I'm going into this fight two levels lower. Unfortunately, here it looks like Feraligatr got a lucky roll against the Executor, because Blastoise doesn't even knock it out with Ice Punch. This allows the uh, pineapple coconut tree thing to set up Sunny Day, which is annoying because it cuts the power of water type moves. However, that doesn't really have an impact on this fight, because I can just use Return to finish off the Alakazam and the Gyarados, giving the sun time to expire. By the time I'm facing his Rhydon, the sun is gone, so I can just use Surf to knock it out, as well as the following Arcanine. And uh, you might think that Blastoise is a little bit ahead of Feraligatr here just because of the clock, but uh, no, I, uh, I forgot to face Surge. Sometimes this does happen. Not very often, I think it's only happened to me like twice now. I didn't mention it when it happened before because it wasn't really important for the narrative, but I figured here that I needed to explain it just because you might be keeping an eye on the time. Anyways, with him out of the way, let's go into the final battle against the most difficult trainer in all of Generation 2. Let's face Red. First of all, I can't believe it, but Blastoise actually has the chance to clock in under an hour and 20 minutes with its first playthrough. I just want to let it sink in that last year with Ho-Oh and Lugia, I could not even get those legendary times under that threshold, so I guess I've just really improved my route throughout Crystal as well as improved as a player. And I'm hoping that that is going to be enough to give Blastoise the win in this first fight against Red. Now obviously Pikachu wasn't a threat because it can just one hit it with Earthquake. Next, Red chooses to send in Venusaur because it has a type advantage against Blastoise. It can also set up Sunny Day. However, I did use the Move Tutor to learn Ice Beam, so I'm able to two-shot the Venusaur quite easily. Next, it's time for Espeon. I use Return, doing more than half. It strikes back with Psychic, which does about a third, and then I finish it on the next turn. Okay, now it's time for what is typically Red's hardest Pokemon, Snorlax. The reason this thing is so powerful is because its special defense is incredible, plus on the first turn in most battles it usually goes for Amnesia. The only reason it doesn't is if it sees a KO with Body Slam, then it will attack you. Because of this, using special moves against it just isn't viable, so Return is the best option here. However, I have a big issue here, which is the fact that Blastoise cannot 3 hit the Snorlax at level 72. What this means is that by the time I get it down to low health, it just uses Rest, healing entirely, and this this is going to continue to repeat because every time it wakes up, it can just heal again. Plus, when it's asleep, it can use Snore to deal out chip damage, and as a result, Blastoise takes a loss. That is, by the way, the first reset in this entire video, so these two are still doing really well. However, I'm a bit worried for Blastoise now, because once I get back to the Snorlax, I have even less health, so I need a Hail Mary play here. If I go for Ice Beam, I might freeze it. And in this case, I actually get it, which allows me to use Return while the Snorlax is frozen. Remember, there is a chance that it defrosts in Generation 2. It is a 10% chance every turn. However, Snorlax doesn't, and I finish it off. Next, Red chooses to send in Blastoise. Looks like my return is doing about a quarter, and even though I resist its water type moves, it's still dealing a decent amount to me, and it looks like my third return is not going to get the KO. It doesn't, Red's Blastoise gets a critical hit just to spite me, and with that, I have got my second reset. I tried one more time hoping for better luck, but this time I get worse luck because the Snorlax paralyzes Blastoise, leading to another reset. Alright, so there's an obvious choice here. If I teach Blastoise Rest, I'm gonna have none of these issues, because then once I'm damaged and I make it later on into the fight, I can just heal up and continue. In this case against the Snorlax, I have a couple ways to win. I can freeze with Ice Beam, or I can get a crit with Return, and it actually happens with my third hit in this battle. So, I've made it back to Blastoise, and since this thing can't knock me out, I finish it off. Red sends in his final Pokemon Charizard, I use Surf, and it goes down. Blastoise clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 32 seconds, with 3 resets at level 73. This took 5 hours and 7 minutes of game time. This is a fantastic first playthrough result for Blastoise, even though it did not squeeze in under the hour and 20 minute mark. I'm sure that with a little bit of practice and a second playthrough, it will be able to though.
So now let's go back over to Fur Alligator and see how it is going to do. I want to remind you again that this was the first playthrough that I did this day, so I'm playing this before I played Blastoise. And here, I was feeling very confident with Fur Alligator. It has completely stomped its way through the entire game. So I head towards Red without teaching Ice Beam from the Move Tutor. I figured that flying back to Goldenrod City, buying the coins required, and then teaching this move was just going to waste a little bit too much time, and for Alligator is poised for perhaps the best all-time finish in a first playthrough. Okay, so how is Red going to be? Against the Pikachu, I can use Earthquake to get the one-shot, and then Red sends in Venusaur. Obviously here, Ice Punch makes sense, and oh, it does less than half. That is not good! This is why I needed Ice Beam. As a result, when I use my second Ice Punch, Venusaur survives, hits Solar Beam, and this does more damage than any other move has done for Alligator in this entire playthrough. However, the powerful Johto starter hangs on with red health. Luckily for this fight, I have the leftover, so I am gaining back a little bit of health every turn. I quickly check the speed comparison with the Espeon, and Feraligatr has 183 speed. Luckily, it just levels up, pushing it up to 185, which is one more than Espeon, so I am going to be able to move first on the next turn. However, here, I make a critical misplay. I go for Surf, because it is getting Stab, but I really should have used Return. Surf does almost nothing to Espeon. It strikes back with Psychic and Feraligatr goes down. So that's its first reset. I decided to train a little bit just to take Feraligatr up to level 72. After all, it is very close to leveling up. And then instead of heading back to learn Ice Beam, I decided to give the Never Melt Ice to boost Ice Punch's damage. In this case, it actually does half to the Venusaur, which is promising. But then my second one gets a worse roll, and Venusaur once again survives, hits Solar Beam, taking Feraligatr down to red health, and now things are not looking good. Unless my beastly attack stat will give me the one hit on Espeon with Return. However, I am nowhere near close getting that damage range, so once again Feraligatr goes down. Okay, I think it is obvious that I need Ice Beam, so I backtrack to Goldenrod City, teach it in the place of Ice Punch, and then I head back to face Red. However, here I was a little bit flustered. I mistimed my inputs, so I was going up to go to Surf and then to Ice Beam, but uh, I accidentally hit Surf and do almost nothing to the Venusaur. My next Ice Beam does not freeze, so Venusaur once again gets a Solar Beam in, and this spells a third reset for Feraligator. In the next fight, I do not make this mistake again. I use Ice Beam twice, knocking the Venusaur out, and finally I am proceeding to the Espeon with full health. This allows me to knock it out over two turns, sustaining just under half from its Psychic in the process. Next is Snorlax, and with Feraligatr's beastly attack stat, I'm going to be able to easily three hit this thing. I take it out, and from here, things should be easier. Notably, I did not teach Feraligatr Rest, which might be a mistake. However, then I get a lucky critical hit on the Blastoise. I guess this is making up for all the human error in the previous fights, and I knock it out. Last is Charizard. I use Surf. Funnily enough, Feraligatr doesn't have enough special attack to knock this thing out in one hit with the super effective move. And this allows Charizard to use Flamethrower. It does a decent amount of damage, which is not enough to finish me off. So with that, Feraligatr has clocked in. It gets a time of 1 hour, 20 minutes, and 6 seconds, with 3 resets at level 73. This took 5 hours and 6 minutes of game time. So reviewing these results, these two Pokemon were incredibly similar. I think that overall I didn't play particularly well at the end of the game, but still, if we compare the times from the beginning of the playthrough, like after Faulkner they were a minute and 27 seconds apart, and then after Red they were a minute and 26 seconds apart. While the difference did shorten throughout the middle of the playthrough with Blastoise gaining back some ground, Feraligatr was just more equipped to deal with Red. After all, strong physical attack for him is very important, just so you can deal with the Snorlax. This is why so often in my playthroughs with first stage Pokemon, I have to rely on using Curse to defeat him, just because the Snorlax feels impossible without it. Alright, so now without delaying any longer, let's get into the second playthroughs and see how I can improve the results for both of these Pokemon. Now ordinarily in this section of the video, I have a lot to talk about, all of the different details that come together to make a playthrough much faster. However, in this case, I am basically going to play the game identically to the first time. I'm just going to try to execute better. However, here I should address the frequently asked question, which is, which hidden power typing am I going to use for my second playthrough? Well, 
Both of these Pokemon have all of the coverage that they need throughout the game. So I'm just going to go with Hidden Power Dark again to ensure that my Pokemon have perfect DVs. The one major change that I'm going to make to the routing is that I'm going to fight Faulkner without doing Sprout Tower. Cutting this section of the game is going to save about a minute and a half of time, and it will allow both Pokemon to clock in under an hour and 20 minutes, even if they have terrible luck against Red in the late game. Now in testing, I found that Bugsy was actually a little bit tricky with Blastoise if you go into it at a lower level. So in this in this case, I'm going to use two withdraws early on against his Metapod. This is going to allow me to survive enough Fury Cutters to knock the Scythe out and take an easy victory. Now mirroring what I did with Feraligator in the first playthrough, I'm going to keep Headbutt on Blastoise's moveset this time and teach Surf in the place of Bite. Against Morty, it is very important to have the Mint Berry. Blastoise only has a 33% chance to one-hit the Gengar, but it does have guaranteed one-hits on all of the other Pokemon. By the way, I do want to note here that because of Gengar's special defense, Surf is actually less good against it, so using Dig will yield better damage. With Surf, the only way you'll one-hit is if you get a critical hit. So now we are going to go rapid-fire through the rest of the gym leaders. Chuck, Jasmine, and Claire are all very easy. I make it to Victory Road, where I can learn Earthquake and easily dispatch the rival. From there, all of the Elite Four members are also easy. However, I think I should mention one exception here, which is Karen. While she isn't particularly challenging, there is the chance to lose here, because I do have to three hit the Umbreon with Blastoise. Yes, Surf is doing the most damage out of all of my moves, even though the Umbreon has incredible special defense. Its defense stat actually isn't that bad, I need to remember that, it's still three digits. However, I got lucky in this fight and it missed Sand Attack, which makes the rest of the battle much easier. And as a result, I am able to defeat her on my first attempt with no resets. Following her, Lance is basically a joke when you have a Water-type Pokemon that knows Ice-type moves. So now, let's quickly check in with some splits to see how Blastoise is doing when compared to its first playthrough. After Lance, I am 3 minutes and 9 seconds ahead of my former time. And when a Pokemon is going that fast, this amount of improvement is quite outstanding. However, let's really reflect on why I've been able to get this amount of time shaved off the playthrough. It is going to be mostly things like not backtracking in certain areas when I'm forgetting things, just overall a more streamlined approach because I'm warmed up with the game and I know how to play Blastoise. And that really leads me to my next point, because once I defeat Blue in Kanto, all of the major improvements for this run are going to come into play, because Blastoise only struggled against Red. And the solution here is very simple for the turtle, because of my defense stat, if I just bring rest into the battle, I am going to be able to knock the Snorlax out fairly easily. And I also did one more thing, which is I got myself over the damage rounding threshold to level 73. This is to marginally improve my damage against the Snorlax, giving Blastoise roughly a 20% chance to knock it out in 3 hits. In this case, I got one of the lucky scenarios that does give me this 3 hit knockout, because my first return gets a critical hit. From there, things are much easier, I can use rest to heal up against his Blastoise, so that I'm not going to get knocked out, and from there, I finish the turtle off, as well as the flying fiery lizard, and with that, my Blastoise has clocked in with the incredible time of 1 hour 15 minutes and 49 seconds. This was with zero resets, and I finished the game just barely under level 74. This took 4 hours and 55 minutes of game time. So with Blastoise, I am very happy with these results. I am 5 minutes and 43 seconds faster than my first playthrough, and I was able to get that level of improvement out of a Pokemon that is performing at near the peak performance for Pokemon in Johto. Going into this, I knew that Blastoise was going to be good, but I didn't know that it was going to be this good. So here's my tier list, and currently Lugia is is in the first spot with a time of 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 57 seconds. So, right now, Blastoise earns itself the second spot overall in the tier list. And I just want to note one quick thing about this data. I had to do 6 attempts with Lugia, and its game time was 4 hours and 56 minutes. So, Blastoise was actually able to get a faster game time by just 1 minute. However, Lugia did finish the game 7 levels lower, so remember, I'm always tracking game time because I think it's an interesting metric, but overall for ranking Pokemon, I don't think it's quite as good as real time. I've described why many times in the past, so I'm not going to get into it today. Just know that I always present all this data, just in case you think that the conclusions that I'm making with the data are not correct, then you yourself can do your own reasoning and come up with your own conclusions.
Okay, so now let's see how the native Johto starter does in its second playthrough. And I'm actually going to do what is probably the largest jump ahead in a playthrough I've ever done. We are going to skip to Erika in Kanto. I am doing this for two reasons. So number one, obviously the rest of the playthrough is easy for Fur Alligator. And number two, I want to note that before I went to Kanto, I did teach Fur Alligator Ice Beam. So now, while I interrupt Misty's date, let's check in with Fur Alligator's splits and see how its two runs are comparing. Mirroring what we saw with Blastoise, after Lance, Fur Alligator has saved roughly 3 minutes and 10 seconds of time. And as I defeat Blue, this time savings has only stayed constant. And just like Blastoise, the majority of the time savings are going to come against Red, who is next. And because this video is basically about how these two are extremely similar, going into the red fight I'm going to be using the same move set. By being level 73 I've guaranteed the 2 hit on the Venusaur with Ice Beam, and from here things are very straightforward. 3 hit the Snorlax with Return, use Rest typically once to heal back my health so that I can survive the final 2 Pokemon, and finish the game with an outstanding time of 1 hour 14 minutes and 39 seconds. For Alligator did this with zero resets just under level 74. Comparing this with the first playthrough, for Alligator saved a little bit less time than Blastoise. It clocks in 5 minutes and 27 seconds faster than the first playthrough, but this is still an incredible amount of time savings. And so where do these results place it in the tier list? Well, if you were listening earlier when I announced Lugia's time, you will now know that for Alligator has secured itself the first spot overall. That pushes Lugia into second place and Blastoise into third, so obviously today, the Johto starter wins the race. However, we're still not quite done because we have to talk about how all of these starters relate to each other. And I think what's really interesting here is that each of the main types of the starters sort of fits into its own role within Generation 2. The water starters outperformed both of the fire starters, I would say significantly so. While the times are quite close, the fire starters were significantly less intuitive to play. Also, it's worth noting that both of the fire starters required hidden power to smooth out their playthroughs, whereas for Alligator and Blastoise were both just like, hidden power, who needs that? Obviously the water starters significantly outperformed the grass starters. With Meganium trailing exactly 11 minutes behind for Alligator's incredible performance. So when people say this cute grass dinosaur is not very good, they are right within the context of the other starters. However, Overall, within the tier list, Meganium's performance was quite good. Now I want to spend a brief moment talking about a couple subjective things here. I think that overall, for Alligator was the easiest starter for me to play. It just seemed very intuitive what I should be doing at every moment. Blastoise was slightly more frustrating, and I mean slightly more frustrating, just because of the beginning of the game having to rely on bubble and tackle. Also, the fact that Blastoise has much less physical attack really does mean that it doesn't get as many one hits, and that makes things feel a little bit less smooth. Of the fire starters, Typhlosion felt very similar to Feraligator. Access to Thunder Punch gave it an easy way to counter water type Pokemon, whereas Charizard felt like the second most bumpy playthrough of all of the starters. Yes, it did significantly outperform Venusaur in terms of its metrics, but that does not mean that Venusaur was not easier to play with. After all, for the grass type, when I figured out that I needed Hidden Power Rock to counter Pokemon like Charizard specifically, the playthrough became very easy. After all, access to Sleep Powder, while slow, is fairly consistent. Whereas with Charizard, especially against Lance's Aerodactyl, and then later on Red's Blastoise. Feeling very similar to Charizard was Meganium, which was overall the hardest starter to root out. There were so many spots that were just a lot harder than they probably should have been. Bugsy was a challenge, I had to use Cut for that fight. By the way, some of you mentioned in the comments that I could use the Daycare to unlearn Cut, which I think is a fantastic strategy. I really wish I had thought of that when I was making the video. I'm really hoping that in the future, we will get to see a playthrough that incorporates that strategy. Anyways, getting back to Meganium's awful playthrough, Petrol in the Radio Tower was perhaps the hardest battle of the entire run. And when you're being beaten by Team Rocket, you know that something is not going particularly well. So now, in the first three generations, I've done at least one playthrough with all of the fully evolved starter Pokemon. So I think next I will have to do the first stage starter Pokemon in Pokemon Yellow. Stay tuned for those later this year. And here, I'm just going to break with my script a little bit and say, hey, if you enjoyed the video, 
please give it a like because it does make me feel better. Also, if you really want to make me feel better, subscribe to the channel because I'm getting fairly close to 60,000 subscribers and that would just make me feel better every time I tell people about the channel because I'm like, hey, I have 60,000 subscribers. Saying 58,000 is uh, not as flashy. And if you want to get informed about when I'm posting new videos, ring the chime echo. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.